Mr. Fawn here. Um, I did this interview with Neil Morse uh, back in the spring of uh, 2017, and it got lost in the shuffle of the different podcasts and stuff, but uh, I thought it would be a terrible tragedy to not bring it to you. So uh, it becomes a Mitch LaFon YouTube exclusive interview. Here is the one, the only, Neil Morse. We are speaking with Neil Morse, of course, uh, the Neil Morse Band, and Morse Fest 2015 is the new Blu-ray DVD that comes out at the end of the month. Uh, Neil, always a pleasure. It's been about a year since we last spoke, so uh, glad to have you back. Well, thanks, man. So let's get right into this um, Morse Fest 2015 DVD. I've, I've been lucky enough to, to have been given a, uh, an advance and a preview. And it's just visually, I mean, forget the music for a second. Visually, it is stunning to look at. Um, so, so talk to me about organizing this and wanting to do Sola Scriptura and Question in Full, getting Mike Portnoy involved, and just the whole presentation, both musically and physically, and what it meant to you. Well, the concept behind the whole Morse Fest thing is like, let's, let's do these albums, some of them that have never been played in their entirety, um, or certainly not with Mike, uh, or with this lineup. Um, but many of them not ever being played and let's do them up to the gills. Let, let, you know, let's, let's pull out all the stops and let's just make it as incredibly wonderful as we possibly can. And, you know, add strings and horns and, you know, whatever else we hear choir and, you know, glockenspiel, whatever it is. I even, I even bought a, a piano harp. It's an auto harp that, that has like keys on it, like you, so you can play it like a piano, like you can, so you can make really weird chords. Because I was listening to the one album, I'm like, oh yeah, Jim Hoke brought o- brought over his piano harp, and it, it's on the album. And so I called him up and said, hey, do you still have that? No, I sold it. <laughs> anyway, I had to hunt one down in Chattanooga or something. It was really crazy, uh, but we, re- you know, that's that's how detailed and into it we got with the music and the production and uh, on every level. And the, the film crew that came in to film it was, you know, at a much higher level than any we've ever had. Uh, Thad Keston and all of his wonderful people. I mean, they'd come and they'd camp out all week and run all these lines all over the place. And just, I mean, it was just crazy. Um, talk to me in terms also of... What does that mean going forward? Is this something that you want to do more often? Take full albums like Sola Scriptura and and present them to to fans, or was this really sort of a one shot deal? Well, I mean, it's become something that's been, you know, it's a pretty successful, a popular thing, you know, everywhere, pretty much that I go on tour. Anybody that's been to Morris Fest will say, "Hey, man, when's the?" Are you going to do one in 2017? You know, every year it's like, are you going to do another one? Oh, that was so great. It's become, um, I don't know, more, almost like a community meeting thing. You know, it, it, there's, a, there's a definite, like, family vibe that happens. And uh, we do special meet and greets and play games with the fans. And, you know, it's, it's sort of like, it was originally kind of inspired, in my mind, by some of the Marillion Weekends. You know, Marillion does these weekend yep. things uh, at, at, like, big campgrounds and, and places like that. And, you know, they do fun things with the with the people, and they present some albums that they haven't played so much. And, you know, it, it's kind of like that, you know. And then they do a special concert on Saturday morning for the uh, Inner Circle, which is kind of like my fan club thing. Right, which I want to and, talk to you about, because there there is this sort of concept with Inner Circle and with what you're talking about right now that you're not just a musician who shows up and has fans, you really sort of see it as, as you said, right? It's a family gathering, right? Well, yeah, there's definitely that kind of a vibe, you know. Um, And a lot of that's a spiritual thing. I think it's because of the spiritual connection, really. You know, that it's more, what I'm doing is more than, you know, um, just, you know, entertainment and making money kind of thing. You know, not that I'm the only one. I mean, lots of musicians are, are you know, have higher goals than, than that. But, you know, I think people know that my, you know, my interest in them, you know, as a Christian, you know, we're, 
<clears throat> we're taught very much to love everyone, and so I'm I'm trying to, you know, show love to everybody, and, and I think they are as well. You know, it's like, it's uh, you know, there's a lot of gift giving going on. You know, people are giving me things, and I'm giving them things, and and we're sharing. And then on on Sunday we have a we have a worship service, and a lot of people are uh, invited to you know share and speak, and people will testify about the great things that God has done in their life. And, and when you connect on that level, it's, uh, it's deep, you know, it can be, sometimes you can feel closer to people in that kind of environment than people you've known a really long time that you don't share such deep things with. And, uh, it's really turned into a very beautiful weekend. It certainly seems like it. Now, you know, faith obviously is something that that's important in your career. So we obviously, we, we do have to talk about it, but, when you, um, what's the word, converted or became a born-again uh, Christian, was there a fear that you might lose some of your fan base, or was that something that you were willing to sacrifice and say, you know what, my personal redemption is worth more than um, X or Y, Z fans? I mean, was there that sort of um, moment where you said, I have to make this choice, and, and if the music doesn't follow, so be it? Sure. Yeah. Yeah, that was really the, you know, kind of, what would you call it, the valley of death that I went through when I felt like I should quit uh, Spock's Beard and Transatlantic in 2002 or uh, right around then. <laughs> I'm so bad with dates. Um, yeah, sure. It was there were a million concerns, you know, what's going to happen to the band, what's going to happen, you know, thinking of the guys in Spock's mainly. Um, because that was my main, you know, my main band, Transatlantic, was a little more like a side project side, right. at that time. And, um, yeah, and, the, you know, what's going to happen with them? What's going to happen with the audiences? Will we, you know, um, for the first time in my life, I'm able to actually support my family with doing my own music, and what's going to happen with that? Are we you know, going to lose everything. Uh, we've got a house payment to make. And there's a lot of practical things that, you, that I had to consider also. But I just felt like, you know, I just felt like the Spirit of God was calling me forth and kept kind of reassuring me that uh, it was going to be all right. It was going to be okay. You know, take that, take the next step, take the next step. Right. And I, uh, I wanted to know what was beyond that step. <laughs> like, well, yeah, well, yeah, but what's going to happen with this and what's going to happen with that? And, Sure, yeah, I was concerned, but I think at that point, I felt like I, my relationship with God had built to the point where I really did trust Him, even though I was concerned, you know, I was worried about those things. And, you know, we, I did lose a lot of people, I think we, you know, audience-wise, you know, not everybody wanted to come on uh, the journey you know, with me, uh, with testimony and one and all that, uh, you know, uh, not everybody's into that sort of thing and that's fine, but, um, I, God's worked it out and creatively and in every way I, I've been incredibly blessed since then. And, and, uh, the similitude album, the new album is, you know, also part of that. It's just, you know, the journey goes on and it's just, uh, it's incredible what God is, what God has done, and what He's doing, and what He's going to do. It's just unbelievable, right? And, and um, since we are on the family theme, uh, I want to talk a little bit about Mike Portnoy because he's sort of been, well, not sort of been. He's he, he's been by your side for almost your entire career, pretty much every project. What does Mike, apart from a drummer, what does he mean to you on a personal level in your life? You know, if Mike moved to China tomorrow and never spoke to you again, what would that do to you? Oh man, that would be a, that would be a tremendous loss. That would be, that would be really rough. We've become, you know, really good friends, very close. And, uh, and, you know, there's a, there's a, a bond, you know, we've, we've been through some storms together. Um, you know, uh, there's nothing like that kind of a bond that you, that you forge together through the things that, you know, we've been through, um, you know, <clears throat> we both quit our main bands and we were there for each other through those things. And yeah, he's a really, uh, really very loyal person, uh, 
at least you know our in our relationship he's shown himself that way and uh, yeah he's a dear friend and and he's also uh, man he's incredibly smart i mean <laughs> sometimes i think maybe i lean on him too much like i i you know i i ask his ad- advice about a lot of different things particularly uh things pertaining to I don't know, like business strategy stuff and 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 also creative presentation stuff, man. I mean, he's he's great with uh with he's great at so many different things. I don't even know how to list them. I mean, oh, oh, playing drums is only one only one little part of the gifts that he has. He's incredibly incredibly gifted and I don't think he ever forgets anything. His mind is is uh wow, just like a like a steel trap. It's incredible. Yeah. yeah, it really is. And and I've actually gotten to spend not a lot of time with him, but a little bit when he was out with Twisted Sister. I got to be backstage and stuff. And he just he he was just sort of sort of a a bright light in the room, if that makes sense, and if it doesn't sound too strange to say. But he just there was just a an effervescence uh, from his presence that was that was felt. Um, oh, that's great. You know, we're also looking at flying colors which is uh, the, another band, another project that you do with Mike. There is talk of a third album coming up. Where are we in that process? And, you know, what is different between a Neil Morse album and a Flying Colors album? Oh, man, it's really different. Right. Um, the process is different. Um, the, of course, the music's, you know, very different. And the, the vocals, they're everything. Um yeah, well, what's happening is that we recorded, I think, seven songs we wrote and recorded. Uh, we got together for a week in December and um, really, really excited about it. I mean, there's some really, really good stuff there. It's hard to wait, you know, um, but because of uh, the schedules of some of the guys in the band, we just have to kind of wait till they have time to, to work on it, and uh, we'll need to get together again and you know, look at it again and write some, write, uh, write some more and work on it until we're happy with it. And I really couldn't tell you when that's going to happen. It's, it's not up to me. Is that, is that something that's also based on Mike's schedule and, and sort of Mike's other commitments? Uh, well, yeah, sure, yeah. It's depending on Mike's schedule, but it's also Steve's schedule. Right. Okay. And, uh, and everybody else. Most of us have a little more time, but you know, we're all doing some things but uh steve is particularly busy with deep purple yeah well <laughs> that's not a bad gig to have of course at deep purple um sure uh, yeah, yeah of course that's, that's a pretty yeah. yeah with an alice cooper tour coming up uh to boot which will be uh and actually a great double package um the inner circle uh, i want to talk about that because you know okay. a lot of fan clubs just will send you a sort of a an eight by ten, and maybe a, a a replica guitar pick, and but yours is way beyond that. There is an unbelievable amount of music that is given out through the inner circle. Um, talk to me about that, and and why, for example, do you not keep those for Neil Morse releases in 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 sort of a more commercial sense? Why is it sort of this close knit group that's getting all this? content well how did it start it started i think in 2005 i was thinking i thought it would be cool to have a subscription you know thing where you know i would give them you know private content and you know uh, send them a disc every other month and um one of my motivations for it you know of course it was you know uh, it's nice to have a another income stream, of course. Um, but one of my motivations is I have a lot of stuff that I want to share with people that isn't really like frontline release material. It's not really either good enough or you know, it, you know what I mean. I have a I, there's a lot of stuff that I have like demos of things or you know bootlegs of old gigs or you know videos of in stores and. You know what I mean? There's a lot of stuff that you couldn't really release. But I, I thought, oh, fans would, would probably really love to have this. You know, this is something that they would think would be really cool. And, and I enjoy sharing those, those things. So that was, that was kind of how it was born. And uh, it's been really cool. I think most people really, really enjoy it. It's, 
it's cheap. You know, it's like ten bucks a month, and and uh, you get a lot of cool stuff. Yeah, and uh, and it's definitely something that uh, fans should check out. Now, uh, let, let me go back to Spock's beard. Before you had said, well, you know, you 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 felt sort of guilty, if that's the word for it, for walking away from the band uh, when you did. Um, Talk to me about the conversations you had with Alan, your brother, about leaving the band. Did you feel that maybe you'd be sort of leaving him in a lurch and that he'd be in trouble if you walked away? How did that relationship play out, or how did that play out? Ooh, well. Um, <laughs> the million-dollar million question, right? Well, I mean, it was... It was uh, we can, I think we can talk about it now. Right. You know, I mean, enough of the smoke is cleared... We're our relationships in really good shape right now, um, and which I'm really happy to say. But it was a rough time. It was. It was. It was a rough time in our relationship. His reaction was, uh, I don't know. It was kind of. I think. I think um, the way I see it is, when I felt in prayer like I should leave was in like September. Um, and I felt like I should finish the snow album and then quit the band, but the snow album took a much longer time to finish than I had anticipated. I mean, we didn't finish it really till May. And so I didn't tell the band that I was quitting till I think June or the end of May, so right around there. And, um, so I had almost nine months to grieve and go through the process of letting go and it was and it was really hard i mean i don't want to make light of it it was there was a lot of tears there was a lot of anguish prayer and a lot of questioning you know going on and uh i wrote a song called crossroads that's on the god won't give up album i wrote it that, that song is about my experience at that time and uh, one of the lines is, confused and uncertain and filled with dread. I'd like to draw the curtain and go back to bed. But I keep on remembering the word that's, words that Jesus said. And that was me kind of talking about how I was at this crossroads and I was really having a hard time making the turn. And, you know, I remember many days I just wanted to just go back to bed. I just couldn't work. I couldn't do anything. And, you know, when you're grieving, it's very hard to to just live, you know. And so I went through I went through all that and then by the time I told the band then they started their grieving process then you know or whatever each each person's totally different so they all went through it in different ways in in different spaces and different timing you know um but um with Al it was rough I mean that that summer I remember his, Kitty his wife calling me uh and Al didn't really want to tell me how rough it was for him, I think, but she she let me know he was really going through it, and he was he was going through the same kind of thing that I was had gone through. We were, you know he was just having difficulty getting through the day, and and uh, yeah, I felt really bad about that, but I felt like it. I I never felt like I was doing the wrong thing. I felt like it was the right thing for me to do that was that it was the right path and that in time that God was going to bless them and me and and I really feel like that that has happened and uh so it's good to be on the other side of it but yeah it was tough um but we never really had like a blowout about it that I remember I don't think we did I think uh what I remember Al saying was like well, I guess if God told you to do it, then who can argue with that? And that was kind of the end of it for him. For him. Um, but but he... it was, you know, we had, we, I, I was still, you know, we're family, right? So I'd fly out there with my kids. My kids were little and his kids were little. And we'd still get together with mom and dad and the family. And, you know, so it was kind of a little tense there for a while, <laughs> you know. But uh, things are good now, and I'm really grateful for everything that's happened. And I, I would imagine at some point you must have had some feeling of guilt where you just said, ah, what have I done? But sometimes you just sort of have to do what you have to do in life, right? I mean, you just sort of have to set forth on your own path, and it's it's just the way it is. Yeah. Yeah, I, uh, 
I never really felt guilty. I did, I I just felt I felt sad. You know, I felt uh, one of the things that I didn't really realize, and I think Al said to me, "Duh." <laughs> once I think once maybe I told him a couple of years after that. It's like, man, I don't hardly see you guys anymore. Like, I didn't, I never, I, I didn't think about like that. I wasn't gonna hardly see Dave or Rio or Nick. Or, you know, we were pretty close. We were, you know, we came up in the trenches together, man. And there was a lot of laughs and a lot of blood, sweat, and tears. You know, and I didn't, uh, I did. It didn't occur to me at the time. I was just trying to get through what I felt like I needed to do. And I didn't realize that, um, you know, we weren't going to see each other very much. And that, that is a, that was, a, that, you know, is a heartache. It's a heartache. But, uh, well, yeah. well, you know, in a sense, and I, and I don't mean to, to make jest of it, but uh, thank God for, uh, for FaceTime and, and uh, Skype at this point. Cause you, can, you can dial them up anytime you need, right? Right, that's true. <laughs> that is true indeed. Um, that's true. The uh, Morris Fest 2015 uh, does include the complete performance of Sola Scriptura, which we mentioned before. And I, I just wanted to get you, your comments on this because uh, the Catholic World Report called it Prague Foolishness. And the uh, Christ- Christianity Today called it an unorthodox view of the Trinity and s- takes swipes at the Catholic Church's history. Um, just, first of all, what do you think of those kind of comments? And, and what was sort of the, the purpose or the greater meaning for the album for you when you put it together? Well, let's see. It started, a, a, a guy, a friend of mine came over and, and gave me the suggestion that I should do a concept album based on the life of Martin Luther. I didn't know that much about Martin Luther. Um, And so I think I went to the library and I checked out a book or some books, you know, and I started reading up on some of the things that he had said and, you know, the things that he had said about the Catholic Church and the things that the Catholic Church had said about him. And, uh, yeah, you know, I mean, it's, there's some pretty pointed parts of that album and, uh, I'm not surprised that that some people would, you know, not take too kindly to it. But um, and I don't. I have to be honest. I don't feel as strongly about some of those things as I felt at that time that I wrote it. You know, but I was really just. I was really kind of taking. Oh, I guess you know, using Martin Luther and the Catholic Church as types or metaphors or images of. You know, in in on the album Sola, Sola Scriptura, really, Martin Luther is representing, I guess you would say, the true believer, the true follower, the true disciple, and the Catholic Church is sort of representing, you know, um, the organized, corrupt church, and you know, or false religion, you might say. You know, it's like the battle between false religion and true religion, really is what that album's about. And, um, I don't know. I'm, I, I hope people don't take it too hard. <laughs> right. But there's I mean, some really, inspi- there's some really inspiring things on the album. I, I feel like, I feel like it was pretty inspired, you know, I mean, and a lot, it's a lot of people's favorite album. There's something about all that conflict that, uh, you know, it's tremendous conflict and brings tremendous resolution. And, uh, that's how I see that record. With you performing that, and and correct me on the name of the other one, but I just call it the question mark, right? I mean, right? Yeah, uh, question mark. Yeah. It, are those two of your more satisfying works? Are those the two that you look back on and say, "Yeah, this is where I really nailed it," or is it just sort of these are two albums that I've never performed and I just thought they'd be fun to do? I mean, what was sort of the thinking behind choosing those two to perform? Well, we had done testimony in one the year before. So those are the two albums that, in sequence that come next, actually. Um, and um, I love both those records. I mean, there's, they're, they're, there's lots of really uh, inspired parts of both those albums, and they're very spiritual. And um, yeah, oh, I, when I, you know, that was a no-brainer. I just signed up for that right away because those are, you know, they're, they're some of my favorites, but I wouldn't say... 
it's very difficult for me to pick albums. You know, it's like picking children and saying, "Yeah, I like that one better than that one." You know, it's but what, it really we, is like that. We all do that, me. don't we? <laughs> I don't. <really. laughs> I, I don't. <laughs> I'm kidding. And I really can't. With I right. mean, you right. know, with between between testimony and one, I you know, I'm, I guess you know my personal favorite. I mean, if I had to choose, I would choose one over testimony. I guess. I might, you know, I might choose one personally for me, you know, that's, I, there's something about that album that's really special to me personally. I don't, I, I don't know why, um, but I don't know. I mean, I like them all, I guess I would, or I wouldn't have made them. Right. And it, and it does come off great in this presentation. Um, and then I'll finish with this cause this is one of the strangest, um, quotes or write-ups that I saw about you, um, it says, in a household full of Priuses, progressive rocker Neil Morse has a 2002 Ford conversion van that has taken on legendary status. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, legendary status. Legendary yeah. status, yeah. So, <laughs> so, so talk to me about your love of, of cars and vehicles in general and this 2002 Ford van of legendary status. <laughs> hilarious uh it's only you know it became more of a thing when these these two young guys that that i'm kind of mentoring that that that, uh i hang out we hang out and we work together quite a bit they work in the studio with me it's uh philip and nathan martin are their names and they uh they, they just love the van they they've decided that van they just call it van van knows you know, Van Van can choose who is who will. It's like the, Yoda. Yeah, right. Yeah, <laughs> Van has knowledge we know not of. You know, this kind of stuff. <laughs> and my, it's so funny because my wife really hates the Van. I don't know when she decided that she hated it. I don't know if she always did, but she just like hates to drive. It's too big, you know, and she just doesn't like the Van. And and the banter between them is just hilarious because sometimes. You know, we're driving around together to we go to church together and whatnot. And uh, you know, she's they're they're trying to get me to give them the van when I you know when I'm ready to get rid of it. You know, and my wife will just say, "Oh, I think you should take it now." I mean, because and they say, "Why?" Well, because it's so uncomfortable. And then the, the, the twins, the the young guys will say, "Well, now you're just lying." <laughs> Because it is really comfortable. I don't even know what she's talking about. So they're always kind of going back and forth about the van. And so, uh, you know, when uh, when I was approached by the Motor Trend, was where, where you read that. Yes, it is. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. where I read that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, when they asked me if, they wanted, if, they, if I wanted to talk about my vehicles, I was like, sure. It's, just, it's also kind of funny because, you know, we have a food truck here as a side business, and then we have the van both of which are immense gas guzzler, gas guzzlers, and then we have these Priuses also. You know, so it's sort of a well juxtaposition, as it were. I, I do sort of want to ask you. You you have the 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 cookie dough and creamery Mojo food truck, um, right? I mean, yeah. I don't even know how to formulate a question, but basically, <laughs> but what is that? I mean, I, I mean, I get that it's a that it's a food truck, and you sell cookie dough and cream but but is it sort of just a hobby is it a, an actual business where if you didn't have it you'd be out on the street i mean just sort of talk to me uh, orientate me or educate me into what that is sure. and what its purpose is and all that wonderful stuff sure uh my family and i were on vacation many years ago and um we went somewhere and they were doing build your own ice cream sandwiches and i thought wow what a cool idea for for a side business kind of thing. And uh, when we came home, I started talking about it with uh, some other people, some other business guys that I knew. Anyway, long story short, we wound up starting one where basically I never wanted to be involved in it except, you know, that I would, uh, you know, finance it and be involved with the product line because, you know, I'm, I'm busy with music and ministry and all kinds of other things. Got my life. My life's pretty full as it is. Uh, so I was looking for you know somebody to kind of uh, take it over and be the manager. You know somebody to really be the this really be the you know CEO sort of thing uh, of it. And I would just be kind of like the 
the investor. And uh, so that, that's how it started. And uh, yeah, it's, it's still here. It's still here. It's still going. It, it, it's described as one of the top uh, dessert food trucks in Nashville, Tennessee. So now, and I, I hear that's a call coming in, so I'm assuming it's the next interview. But I'll finish with this then. If I ever go down to Nashville and I find the uh, Mojo cookie dough uh, and creamery truck, will you be selling me an ice cream bar? <laughs> no, I try to never actually, as much okay. as possible, I try to never actually be there. Only, only in dire emergencies. <laughs> in dire emergencies, that sounds. Yeah, no, great. Other, other people run it. I just, I, I'm just the owner. Just the owner. There you go, uh, Neil. Uh, again, uh, a great pleasure, just as it was the last time. Uh, I wish you continued success. I missed your show in Montreal. That was in January, I believe, of this year. But uh, we'll definitely make sure to grab the next one. All right, man. Well, sure. Great talking with you too, and uh, thanks for calling, man. Yeah, thank you. Have a good day now. All right, you too. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye. Big thank you to Neil Morris for having taken the time to chat. Uh, my apologies for having uh, let it slip through the cracks and uh, released it uh, a few months after it was done. But there you go. Uh, please follow me on Twitter, at Mitch Lafon, Instagram, at underscore Mitch Lafon, and, of course, the Google Mitch Lafon, where you can find all kinds of weird and wacky things. Uh, thank you, folks. Cheers. <laughs>